And we found that companies have the ability to double or triple the value. Most companies, most private companies anyway, have the ability to double or triple their values over a three to five year period. If they really understand all of the risk factors that are constraining their growth and profitability and value, and they become focused and disciplined to improve those weaker areas. Welcome to Life After Business, the podcast that helps you understand how to increase the value of your business, what your company is worth, and what your exit options are. Host Ryan Tansom and his guests give you all the information you need to get clarity and control over your business and take pride in a valuable company that gives you freedom and choices to exit on your terms. Welcome back, everybody. This is episode 177 of the Life After Business podcast. This is Ryan Tansom, your host. And today, I'm going to be kicking off a mini-series about how to increase the value of your company. There are five growth and exit principles, and you can't take one of them out and still have complete focus over where you're trying to go because if you take out your drivers, which is the first principle, then you don't necessarily know where you're going. If you take out principle number three, which are your different exit options, you might not have as clear of a direction of when and how you might pull the ripcord and why you should be building value. So what's interesting about these principles is they're all extremely necessary for you to accomplish your goal of having a valuable company that gives you freedom of choices when and how to exit your ownership or your management roles, responsibilities to completely engineer intentionally the outcome that you want. And today we're going to be diving into the fourth principle, which is the increased value. And I'm having a little bit of a mini series based on the eight functional areas that Ken Sanginario is going to talk about. So I figured the best way to kick off this mini series is to repost the episode that I did with Ken Sanginario, who is the creator of the value opportunity profile, which is a way that actually objectively analyzes the risk of your business. Because there's a lot of systems out there right now that can help you gauge you know, how valuable your company is and ways to increase the value, but none as effective of showing you in actionable terms, what you can do to de-risk your company and de-risk that cash flow to increase the value of the company. So what you're going to hear through this episode that I reposted with Ken Sanginario is his background, how he's one of the smartest people I know from being a turnaround investment banker to a public company CFO, master's in tax and finance, unbelievable genius in finance, but he translates that into operations of a business into eight functional areas. And Ken and I are going to describe how you can de-risk your company. And over the course of the next month or so in the handful of episodes that I've recorded is I want to discuss to you the planning driver, which is strategic planning. We're going to talk about, and I'm going to interview Pat Hobby, my partner, about financials, forecasting, modeling, and how those reflect your strategic plan. I've got an interview in the hopper about sales and how to build out a sales team and a sales machine that is repeatable just like finance. I'm going to be interviewing people on the people category and how to hire and retain people, how to hire your integrator or your second in command, your COO, CFO. So we have all these different episodes teed up in order to show you these are the things that you need to do to increase the value of your company by reinvesting that EBITDA so you have the ability to have freedom and choices and control when and how you ever decide to exit. Because at the end of the day, the more valuable company you have, the more freedom and choices you have. I mean, it's just that simple that allows you to get your your drivers principle number one and hit your financial targets principle number two and give you more choices from the exits in principle number three if you want to know more about the uh, the framework that we have and the five principles, check out our two-day growth and exit boot camps. It's five grand, and we use two case studies with $10 million in revenue, a million in EBITDA, and we walk you through for two days how two different companies were able to go get what they wanted by increasing the value of their company in light of the end goal that they wanted with their exit and their timeline. So without further ado, I really hope you enjoy the foundational episode about how to increase the value of your company with Ken Sanginario. Sponsored by Arcona's Growth and Exit Boot Camps, two days jam-packed with material on the five growth and exit principles and the world of mergers and acquisitions. You'll walk away knowing exactly what steps to take to get your target valuation and your best exit option. Two days at Arcona's Boot Camp will give you the clarity to control the rest of your journey as an entrepreneur. Ken, how are you doing? 
Doing great, Ryan. Thanks. How are you? Good. And we were just laughing because this is the second time you've been on the show and it's been about two years, which we neither of us believed it was that long. So I can't believe it. I <laughs> know that it was three years ago that I met you and it goes uh, really fast. But, you know, for the listeners that may have not listened to your episode, um, I would like you to maybe explain a little bit of your background again for the new, uh, the new listeners. Cause I think by the, the time that you had done your episode, I was not having the momentum that I think we now have with our listeners, but in your background is important for this episode as you and I plan on taking a different approach of really educating everybody that's listening on business valuations, your background and the, just the, the, the inherent problems that are kind of going on with the baby boomers retiring and how business valuations are done and how to maximize the value of the company. So your background that led you to your expertise is super fascinating. So why don't you just kind of give our listeners like, how did you get into this and what did the, how did your background lend you to where you are today? Sure. Thanks. Uh, for the last 19 years, I've been a business consultant advising middle market and lower middle market private companies. And for most of those 19 years, I was actually a turnaround consultant, one of the only about 500 certified turnaround practitioners in the U.S. And in those roles, uh, I would often take deep dives to uh, take, actually take over the operation of a company at the request of sometimes the business owner, sometimes a private private equity firm that owned the company, sometimes a bank because the company was in workout and the bank wanted to have their own person running the company. And I would take over and develop and execute a turnaround strategy and then either recapitalize or sell the company on the back end. So through that process, uh, and, and those engagements actually, they would last anywhere from say six to 18 months. And through that process, I got involved in business valuations and then in mergers and acquisitions. So I ended up uh, managing M&A transactions as well. And um, those were often really deep dives, deep turnarounds of companies. And back during the, rece the recession in 2008, 2009, we were getting a lot of requests, my partners and I, uh, from some of the larger bank workout groups who were getting inundated with troubled companies being pushed into workout. And the banks didn't even have the bandwidth to properly triage these companies coming into workout. So they were engaging us to go spend a week or two in the field and assess these companies and write a report and come back and let the bank know, hey, is this company a train wreck that we need to fix right away? Or can it be put on the back burner? Can it be fixed? And if so, how? And can you help fix it? So we started doing a lot of those kinds of assessments. And in doing them, I started realizing, I had three other partners at the time, I started realizing that we all did high quality work individually, but we all had our own approaches. And if we were to take, say, 10 of our reports and lay them out on a conference table, and each of us have done two or three, our reports would often look very different. And we might get to the same answer on any particular engagement, but our process was our processes were different from each other. We would interview clients differently. We would write our reports differently. Our just our sort of language that we used in our reports was different. The flow was different. We'd cover different issues in different sequences and different depths and so forth. Ultimately, we'd probably get to the same answer on any given engagement, but we'd get there very differently. And it started to concern me at first from a quality control standpoint, when I would, I would say uh, to my partners, hey, you know, if, if we have one bank that engages us for 10 assessments, our reports need to have the same look and feel. They need to mm -hmm. have the same flow and the same way, the, the same process that we follow so that the bank has confidence that they're not hiring four individuals, they're actually hiring a firm. And secondly, from our, our own quality control standpoint, we need to make sure that we have a process that can stand up under pressure and be used consistently so that we can scale our own practice, so that we can train associates that might want to join us how to actually do this kind of work. So that was one of the, the genesis of developing what has now evolved into our software platform called the Value Opportunity Profile, which I'll describe in a little bit more detail. But the second factor in starting to develop that kind of a software platform 
was my experience in the business valuation world. And uh, it, was, it was interesting because I went through formal training uh, from two different associations to get certified as a business valuator. And both of them gave basically the same kind of training. And in the training, you're required to go through all of uh, a, a whole lot of kind of deep dive due diligence on a company. And you're, you're required to go through certain processes that you may know going into the engagement that some, some or all of these processes are not going to be valuable in the end product, your valuation conclusion or evaluation report. But you still have to go through the process just to document that you went through the process and, that, and turned out that, that certain approaches were not, were not relevant or were not credible for that particular kind of engagement. What struck me was that there's one section of the valuation process that has the absolute biggest impact on the value calculations of a company or on the conclusion of value of a company. And it has absolutely the least amount of training around it and the least amount of field work required in order to make your conclusion around that factor. And it's a factor called company specific risk, which has become sort of near and dear to everything that I do, the way I look at companies, the way I assess companies and the way I value them, the way I, the way I advise them all uh, now surrounds this whole concept called company specific risk and company specific risk is a process of identifying and understanding all of the qualitative factors of a company that can impact the company's future favorably or unfavorably. So think of it as, as any, any factor, any particular area of a company that might constrain the company's ability to grow, to become more profitable, and to have cash flows in the future. We, we, we have three sort of the three factors that I label cash flows to be the most valuable. Are they sustainable? Are they predictable? And are they transferable? And so any qualitative factors of a company, any areas of a company that are not quite developed, um, that could be constraints to the company's cash flows being sustainable, predictable, or transferable, impact the company-specific risk factor. They are risk areas of a company. So any risk mm -hmm. area of a company impacts its future cash flows and impacts the value of that company. So that's, those are kind of the ways that I started creating a standardized approach to be able to efficiently but comprehensively assess a company for the purposes of these bank workout groups, but also to take that process into the business valuation world and improve the valuation process so that valuations could not only, could not only be used for compliance purposes, but they could also be used for strategic purposes. And by under, really understanding the constraints and the risk factors that impact the company's value you can turn the whole process around and use it to help companies strategically, help them improve, help them reduce their risk, improve their quality, and increase their value. And we found that companies have the ability to double or triple the value. Most companies, most private companies anyway, have the ability to double or triple their values over a three to five year period. If they really understand all of the risk factors that are constraining their growth and profitability and value, and they become focused and disciplined to improve those weaker areas. Which I am so excited to dive into this because everybody's probably going, okay, how do I do that? And, you know, we will be diving into your underlying methodology and some of the stuff. And, and I'll be even giving some of my own two cents because I, went through your training on the system and your processes uh, for the certified value growth advisor in December. And I just, that, that's why I wanted you on the show so bad because I think you're bringing transparency and a standard operating procedure behind some, like a world that is totally like one big black hole. And even though we've had valuation experts on the show and we're going to be diving into some of the back end ways that you're doing this, but I think, you know, your process can is based in finance, which I think is so crucial because right now there's a lot of these systems or different people that are popping up left and right that are value, you know, that are trying to identify value drivers for the lower and mid market, which is absolutely fantastic. But you know, there is a lot of 
you know, subjectivity to it, or there's like your know, random numbers that come out of it, but there's not actionable stuff and they're not tied to a valuation and actual cash flow. So what I, and that's why I just think it's so crucial what you've done and maybe explain it. So not only were you an investment uh, banking slash turnaround consultant, but you have a lot of acronyms behind your name. So maybe you want to kind of give a little bit of overview on some of the credentials. And I know you probably don't like to do this, but I think it's, <laughs> and it, it lends some context to why this all has come to where it is today. Sure. I started my career as a, as a CPA working in what back then was the big eight accounting firms of Coopers and Librand. For some people that may remember that that firm became then be, Came the big six, Coopers and Library, and then became part of Pricewaterhouse Coopers, which is now PwC. So I was there back in the early and mid 80s, and then I was uh, a controller and then CFO for three companies uh, one, uh, two private and one public. And in my public CFO experience, that's where I kind of cut my teeth in the turnaround world because this was a, it was a public company that had a whole series of operating divisions, several of which were deeply distressed. So I spent uh, three years doing a grueling workout and turnaround of the distressed operations of a public company. So that was, that's where I learned the, turner, the art of the turnaround first. So besides a CPA, I then uh, got sort of trained and certified with two valuation credentials, one from an organization called NACFA, the National Association of Certified Valuators and Analysts, and one from the American Institute of CPAs, the AICPA. So I have their two credentials, the CVA and the ABV, uh, Certified Valuation Advisor, I guess it, they changed the name to and accredited in business valuation, that's the ABV. Then I have an M&A certification from the Alliance of Merger and Acquisition Advisors, the AMNAA, and that credential is called a Certified M&A Advisor, CMNAA. And uh, then I have the turnaround credential, the CTP, Certified Turnaround Practitioner. That's from the Turnaround Management Association. And uh, of course, I have the Certified Value Growth Advisor. That's our own credential that we started three years ago. Our training program, five-day, very rigorous training program that you went to, you just went through back in December, and that is uh, accredited, I guess, so to speak, by uh, the CPA industry, the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. It's all the state boards, state CPA boards all around the country approve programs so that you can grant continuing ed credits. So we have a very rigorous program that meets all the criteria of a, of a real training and certification program. So our CVGA credential has been gaining traction and gaining recognition, uh, not only in the U S but now internationally, as you, you may recall, just in our last session in December, we had several um, attendees from the Netherlands, from Bahrain, from Canada. We have, uh, and from, uh, we have somebody coming from Mexico in our next, in our upcoming session in March. So um, it, it's, it's gaining now reputation and credibility uh, outside the U.S. as well. So I think I covered all the credentials. Don't I you have like a master's or something like that too? Oh, I have two. <laughs> oh yeah, I have two masters. <laughs> I have two master's degrees. I do have two master's degrees. I'm kind of a lifelong learner. And um, was one, it tax one, and finance or? Well, one was a master, master's in tax, taxation, master of science in taxation. That was um, really back when I got that, it really was an MBA program. That was, a, that was an 18 course program, which really was an MBA program with a concentration in, in corporate taxation. So um, the degree back then was MST, Master of Science and Tax Day, Taxation. Today, that would, that would have been an MBA with a concentration in taxation. And then I got a uh, Master of Science in Finance, which was a grueling, very rigorous, hugely valuable program that I went through as well. I can't believe you just forgot about those two things, which would be <laughs> like a world life achievement if they were to go through it. And the, the, the reason that I wanted you to describe the alphabet soup that you have behind your name is because I think it is really important to understand your perspective on how you're looking at this stuff. And then, and we're going to, we're going to be getting, getting into kind of like how, what we call the buildup method and how you're actually identifying the, these value drivers and tying it to the, you know, more in depth uh, valuation. 
And, you know, my two cents, Ken, is that like what I've seen is that, you know, there's this whole world of, you know, the, the investment banking and the, the, uh, the private equity and the big financiers, right, that understand capital and finance better than anybody else, right? Right. You're approaching and always going for the 5 million and EBITDA and above because they're big, quote unquote, they call companies assets, right? Because they want a return on their investment. So they're right. looking at them literally like, like, like stocks or like asset, uh, right. asset classes. And that whole world doesn't usually trickle down because the really, really, really smart people go up and they make big, big bucks at those different shops. But what you've done is you've taken your background and some and a standard system to bring that kind of level of sophistication down to a way where it all makes sense to everybody. But we're actually approaching this stuff from a world of finance and like, what is the return on your investment of a business, which is what all owners should actually look at because it's a lot of risk and a lot of things that they've done. And how do you identify going back to what you said, the company specific risk. So I think it's important for the listeners to know it's all based in money and capital. And that is what I find very intriguing. And maybe, you know, before we kind of jump into what the build up method is and your, and how that fits into the, um, the company specific risk, but maybe explain how in the valuations right now, what the, you know, you call the safe harbor and how that's identified. And maybe that kind of ties into the, the build up method. So I don't know however you want to approach that. That makes the most logical sense, but I think it's a key function of really extending the, the, the rest of the interview. Um, so let me give you kind of the big picture of how valuations work, the valuation process. Whenever you, whenever a valuator is engaged to issue a, what they call a conclusion of value on a company, that's the highest level of, assurance that you, that a evaluator can give in a valuation report called a conclusion of value. You have to go through three approaches to value the company. The, the approaches are called the asset approach, the market approach, the income approach. The asset approach is just a, an approach to look at all of the hard assets of the company and try to estimate what the replacement cost would be of, of, of those assets. So that be, basically becomes kind of a floor value. If there's no marketability to the company in the company or, or there's a, or, or the, uh, the value based on the other, the second two approaches um, is lower than the floor, then the floor becomes the conclusion of value. Got it. The second approach is the market approach. That's an approach where you go out to the, you go out to the marketplace by looking at databases that are subscription based and you try to find transactions in companies that are in the same or similar industries as your subject company and that are the same or similar sizes of your subject company and maybe sometimes even in the same or similar regions of the country or the world as your subject company. And in, in the lower middle market, which we define as companies with about five to a hundred million in revenue. Uh, so in the lower middle market, there are several databases that valuators use for that market approach. But the problem is most of the databases, they're, they're very opaque. <laughs> look at transactions. First of all, you can't find enough transactions. If you're looking at a company that's a $10 million revenue company, and they're in a certain niche manufacturing business. Well, that niche manufacturing business may be very different from other manufacturing businesses of similar size. And so it can be very difficult to find a database of transactions, to find enough transactions in any database that um, are similar enough to your subject company that you can draw any credible correlations to. And so, very often you're sort of stuck right there. You just can't find enough transactions in your market approach to rely on that approach to determine a value. If you can find the transactions, often they are so opaque that you don't know what was included in the transaction. So again, it's hard to draw any correlations because was it an asset sale? Was it a stock sale? Was there uh, real estate involved? Was there, were there working capital adjustments involved in the transaction? Was it an all cash deal or did the owner 
take back some seller paper uh, when when selling it? Was it was there an earn note involved? Did the owner sell a hundred percent, or did he sell, you know, seventy percent or fifty percent? Uh, just all of these factors that are not reported in the databases cause you cause the transaction to be so opaque that you can't draw any correlation. There's just not enough information. Well, and even Ken, like you don't even know why the person bought it, right? Whether it was a tr- strategic sale or geographic. Yeah. Goals, like yeah. no reason why it's just a number, right? Right. Yeah. They give you some statistics and even, even when they report multiples, which is the kind of what everybody feels most comfortable discussing, even though, you know, I could spend an hour on my, <laughs> I could get up on, on stand up on my desk, which I've been known to do in training programs to talk about the, fallacies of multiples using multiples for valuation but even when people talk about multiples and you look at multiples in these databases the the multiples are you, you don't know what's in the multiple and you don't even know if the if the earn you know when they it's a multiple of earnings but you don't even know if the earnings are calculated the same way among the companies that are in the database. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they use reported earnings. Sometimes they use adjusted earnings. Sometimes they use uh, earnings with the owner's salaries added back. They, you know, they call it, uh, you know, discretionary earnings, uh, owner discretionary earnings. Sometimes they use it earnings. They calculate with the earnings after owner salaries. You just don't know. And so the multiples can be kind of meaningless. In fact, I had an article I wrote a while ago Actually, it was probably about 18 years ago. I wrote an article called "Meaningless Multiples." <laughs> <laughs> a little so heavier. I've, I've been on this kick for a long time. <laughs> so, and then the third approach, which I believe is the the most credible approach to calculating the value of a company, is called the income approach. And I'm not the only one that believes that there are people who are far more credible and established and authoritative than I, people who have written textbooks and the actual, the sort of godfathers of the whole valuation industry talk about the income approach being the true way to calculate the value of a company. And any other approach you use needs to be reconcilable to the income approach. So just because you find a company in a transactional database somewhere that says, hey, these these companies sold for 50 times earnings, that doesn't mean that your subject company should sell for 50 times earnings unless it has the income, the cash flows to support that kind of multiple, which it rarely, which they rarely will. So the income approach, if you think about the value of a company, is really a collection of the values of the assets within that company. And the value of any given asset, uh, and this comes from the Master of Science in Taxation program, we learned about how to value particular assets, individual assets, in a, where a company is just a collection of all of those individual assets. And the value of any individual asset is only the the value of the cash flows that that asset can generate in the future. So sometimes people will say, Hey, I have this piece of machinery. Um, I paid a million dollars for it. So it should be be worth at least a million dollars. Well, that's fine. The piece of machinery is obsolete, right? Are you using it? No, (laughs) not really. It's just over. We still have it. It still works. It still runs. But now (laughs) there are other ways to do that process. So we don't really, okay. So what cash flows is that machine? going to generate in the future? None. So that machine now has zero value. It might have some salvage value value for the, you know, the weight of the metal, but that's probably about it. So (laughs) if you think about a company being a collection of its individual assets, a company's value basically is the value of the cash flows that that company can generate in the future. And so we, we talk about the value of the assets sort of being determined by the, again, the sustainability, the predictability, and the transferability of those future cash flows. Mm-hmm. So sustainability means if you think about things like, okay, a comp- let's say a company, has, they only, a company only has two customers and one customer is 90% and the other customer is 10%. And those, that's all the customers that the company has. Well, how sustainable do you think that unless they unless that ninety percent is a contract with the u s government a fifty year contract or something, then there's no reliability you can't you can't rely that that the cash flows from that contract are going to be sustainable because the customer could cancel the contract the customer could go out of business and the the 
the company's cash flow would just disappear overnight, right? So it's so that's one kind of factor, customer concentration. I use that as a I use customer concentration as a common factor because that's one that a lot of people are uh, mm-hmm. familiar with. So, but there are a hundred other factors that might impact the sustainability of a company. Do they, is the owner 90 years old and in poor health and all of the knowledge, all of the secret sauce of the company is in the owner's head. Well, how sustainable do you think their revenues are? If that owner dies mm-hmm. or becomes incapable of running it, the revenues could disappear overnight. Those are extreme examples, but what happens if the company doesn't have really good systems and processes and people, they're weak in different areas? What happens if they don't do a good job with risk management? What happens if you know, they have no planning in, involved in the company? And just all of these factors that could impact the sustainability of the cash flows. Well, what's interesting, Ken, is that when you actually, because a lot of this stuff has to do with, you know, like the 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 hype that's going on in the market of transferability and like the owner being reliant on, yeah. you know, all this stuff is it's starting to kind of bubble up. But I think, you know, when you say, and, and I want to maybe pe- peel back the income approach a little bit without getting too technical and that kind of ties up into, you know, this next of the buildup and then the actual valuations and stuff that you're looking at, like you just boiled it down that how much cash is this thing going to kick out? Like how, what's the risk of that? If you're actually looking at it from an investment perspective, whether that's the culture, the people, all the different genetic makeup of that business, how does it kick out that cash? Which, you know, the the income approach, you know, and kind of tying into the discounted cash flow, that's like literally finance, right? So you look at the internal rate of return of a bond or the internal rate of like all the listeners here have investments in their 401k or they're looking at cap rates in real estate. So people are familiar with this stuff. It's never just been overly generalized or, you know, or accepted by the, the bit, the lower mid market businesses, because they don't think there's no been way, no way to do that. So maybe kind of explain the discounted cash flow method and like, and I don't know what order you want to do with that buildup, but how you determine this stuff from a financial perspective going, okay, great. But there's a lot of factors that go into what you're talking about. So, okay, great. So if you think about a company's future cash flows, first of all, a company has to be able to predict its future cash flows. And most companies in the lower middle market in particular, or even you know, smaller into the micro market, they almost never have projections. But most companies in the lower middle market do not have credible projections of their businesses because they have <laughs> no credible planning function within the companies. So they don't do strategic planning. They have no idea. I have, I have clients that say, you know, we, we, plan, we do a lot of planning, but it's all one year. It's all a current year plan. It's really a tactical plan. It's not a strategic plan. So they're not planning about what markets, you know, how they want to grow, how big do they want to grow, and how will they get there? What markets do they want to penetrate? What products and services do they want to bring to the market? How do they want to expand? When do they want to expand? How will they go about achieving that? They have no planning, so they can't prepare credible projections of the future cash flows of the company. So what ends up happening is anybody who's looking at a company's cash flows, they can only use the historical cash flows as a proxy for the future. Well, in most cases, if a company is growing, looking at historical cash flows will penalize the value of the company Mm -hmm. because the future cash flows will be greater than the historical cash flows if they're growing and they're profitable. So that's the predictability. I said sustainability, predictability, and transferability. The transfer, let me just uh, finish that thought. The transferability has to do with, has the secret sauce of the company been institutionalized across the whole company so that if something happens to the the owner or the CEO or anybody in the leadership team, the secret sauce won't leave the company with that person. Mm -hmm. And the company can continue to run. The value of the company is transferable to a buyer because it is institutionalized. It doesn't rest in one or just a, a, a few key people. So that's the sustainability, predictability, transferability. So the cash flows, if you, if a company does have, projections, then it's a matter of, okay, well, what are those future cash flows worth today? And so the, the ability to value those, that's the crux of the income approach. And in order to value those cash flows, you have to look at the riskiness of the company's ability to achieve those cash flows. We do that 
by assessing all of the qualitative elements of the company across the whole enterprise. In our process, we've identified what we believe to be the eight primary categories that every company has to have in place, fully developed, and very importantly, in balance with each other in order for the company to reach peak performance and achieve maximum value. And the eight categories, there's science behind the eight. I won't really go in too much into that, but the eight categories are planning, leadership, sales, marketing, people, operations, finance, and legal. And those are the eight functional categories that every company has to have fully developed. And we've taken those eight categories. We didn't make them up. There's science behind them. But we've taken those eight categories and broken them down into subcategories. So we end up with nearly 50 subcategories in our, in our, the way we look at a company, in our assessment process. And we assess each of those roughly 50 categories, subcategories, against a theoretical best in class standard. So we're trying to assess how well developed is the company in each category against a best in class standard. And we've tapped industry experts and functional experts for each of those subcategories in order to determine what a best in class standard would look like. So different industries and different functional categories have different best in class standards. We've built a suite basically of best in class standards across industries and across functional areas using experts, not only relying on our own knowledge. Well, and what's interesting too is, and I don't know if you're going to go this way and I'm interjecting, but you're tying all of these in. So like just for the listeners, who, you know, so John Warlow's got eight key categories too, but you know that what's different about Ken's or any of these other valuation ones are they're tying. And by the way, like we're, we're using this for our clients and Ken and I've been working on some clients together that they're, they're very specific of like, and this is kind of what I was saying earlier that the private equity firms and investment bankers have been analyzing this stuff. So the in due diligence, or if someone's buying it, the, these PE firms or financial buyers, they know this stuff because they've got a team of financiers that are going in looking at the internal rate of return of a business of why they're going to buy it. Because if they're going to spend $15 million in their company, they want to return on that investment, right? Just like in real right. estate. And right. so in real estate, they've got, you know, people have ways of, of identifying what the, you know, the sustainability, predictability, and transferability of that real estate is, right? And so they, right. they like I, in kind of, this is my own two cents, Ken, is that these, you know, every PE firm or all these different financiers have come to, like you said, they kind of all operate like you and your partners did, where they all kind of, they all know exactly what they're looking for because they got the spreadsheets and they understand business, but there's been no way to systematize that into ways that actually make sense without a huge team of people. And so you're tying these different, you know, subcategories all towards that company specific risk and evaluation, right? So it's not just completely made up. No, absolutely. I mean, we've, we've essentially taken the due diligence process. So my whole approach, and you, you know, you, you asked earlier about my background, my credentials and things like that, but I, I studied those areas, those knowledge bases for a reason. And the reason was to bring those knowledge bases together because very often they're disparate knowledge bases. There's overlap among all of them. There's overlap between M&A and business valuation and turnaround management, but nobody's ever brought them all together before. And I've taken those knowledge bases and put them into a platform so that the due diligence of a company is directly tied to the value of that company. So I take a due diligence process, make it very efficient, but very comprehensive. And I have private equity individual private equity investors who are investors in, in my company as well. And what they really liked about our process was just that. They said, you've, you've, you've taken something that we do that has taken us years and years to learn individually. We all do it our own way. We all get to the same answer, but we have a hard time. They said the same thing. We have a hard time training new associates in the firm. They just have to hang around one of us for, you know, a decade. And eventually they, you know, they learn how we get to the conclusions that we get to. But your system has taken that and sort of short circuited the whole process so that we can get there a lot quicker and it can be scalable in our firm. So that's what they, that's what they like about it. But it, it essentially takes all of the risk elements that a private equity firm would look at as a financial buyer and converts those risk elements into a risk factor that then flows into the valuation of those future cash flows. 
So just think about it, it makes perfect sense. The higher quality and lower risk the company is in all these qualitative functional areas, the higher the value of their future cash flows will be today. Mm -hmm. If a company is, pre is projecting cash flows in the future, but they have a very underdeveloped company, the risk of the company achieving those future cash flows is, a, is high, high risk. High risk means lower value today of those future cash flows. It's so interesting, Ken, as I was going through the system and like, in it, cause again, it's stuff that we did at, you know, imaging path before my dad and I sold it's all, but it was all like, you know, just gut or like talking to people and just kind of like, and then how do you prioritize, you know, so if you got a million dollars and retained earnings this year and you want to deploy your capital, how are you going to spend it? Right. And I think that's, again, what happens on the big public companies is they have people understanding under like literally finance teams talking about how to allocate their capital for next year, right? So I don't know, it, 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 just some basic examples, and then I'm sure you've got plenty more, is like as I was going through it, whether it's understanding the leadership team, which everybody talks about, but then also like whether it's the forecasting or are they using, like are all of their technology systems separate or are they integrated? Like, you know what I mean? It's just like common sense stuff, but you're, you're putting it all together and then you should be able to identify because like I, so many people, and like even like the, the Vistages or the EO, or these uh, CEO peer groups, people just randomly decide what they're going to do and when they're going to do it and how they spend their money. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Absolutely. And what we find is most companies are strongest in the functional categories that reflect the background of the owner or CEO of the company. So if the owner is an engineer by background, then they'll be strongest in the technical areas of the company. They'll be strongest in operations. They'll probably be strongest, strong in finance. They'll be strong in legal, kind of the compliance type areas. They'll be weak in the natural opposite areas. What's the natural opposite area of say an engineer? It's the marketing side. <laughs> sales, marketing, yeah. sales, marketing, and people, right? Those are the sort of natural weaker areas for somebody that's a technical, technically focused person technically educated and technically focused. So, but, but the interesting thing is when we then ask them where they're, where they're investing all of their time and energy and resources, human resources and financial resources to grow and expand the company, they're putting it all in the areas where they're already strongest. It's not getting them one dime of incremental value because the weaker areas are the constraints. Mm -hmm. That we try to push them out of their comfort zone, call their attention to the weaker areas, redirect some of their investment of time and resources into the weak areas to create more balance in the company so the company can then grow in a balanced manner and not have the constraints and not have the, the weak areas. It's, it's like a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. So in my turnaround career, a lot of my companies, a lot of my clients came to me as turnaround clients because they grew so fast, they, they basically imploded under their own success. They grew so fast, that they didn't have the infrastructure properly developed to support the growth, and then they imploded. They'd stop, you know, they, they would have quality control problems or delivery problems. They would start losing customers because they were delivering late, they couldn't meet deadlines, the suppliers couldn't keep up with their demand, so they had all these problems. They could sell, they could sell like, you know, they, they could sell faster than they could deliver. And that ended up um, causing them to go mm -hmm. into distress. So, um, so why, why you explain it, which makes a ton of sense. And so that maybe kind of ties back to the, the eight categories and why they all need to be balanced and how that impacts your cost of equity. And I'm sorry, May, I, you and I were talking about this, like kind of get a couple of these interchanged, but there's the cost of equity and the cost of capital, right? Because capital is a big constraint for these, for mid market companies too, right? So right. They're, they're trying to look to grow efficiently, allocate their capital in the right way, reduce the risk. And so how do the eight, how do the, the science of the eight categories identify that this is the well-rounded and then how does that impact the cost of equity and capital? So the way our process works is each one of the, each subcategory gets a quality score and the quality score, the flip side of quality is, is a risk factor. 
And so every one of our roughly 50 categories gets a quality and risk factor. And those all roll up together to create a quality score at, for each of the eight primary categories. And then those roll up <clears throat> to create a quality score for the overall company. And the, the flip side of the quality is a risk profile. So they got a quality profile and a risk profile. And the risk profile is a risk score, turns into a risk score. And the risk score flows into the cost of capital of a company. So if you think about the company's future cash flows and how they're valued today, they're, they are discounted to today's value using a discount rate. The discount rate is a, essentially the company's cost of capital. The cost of capital is, it's, it's, it's important to know that the cost of capital is comprised of two components. It's the cost of equity and the cost of debt, and it's the blend of equity and debt in the company's capital structure in the way that they finance their business. And the cost of equity and the cost of debt are from the perspective of an outsider looking in. They're from the perspective of a buyer, not from the perspective of the owner inside, you know, thinking about those factors um, themselves. So, it's how an outsider would view the company from a quality and risk standpoint and how an outsider would be able to finance the acquisition of the company given the company's current risk and quality profiles. And without, without a buyer adding any credit enhancements, such as personal guarantees or additional asset, assets as collateral that may be uh, unrelated to mm -hmm. the company, something like that. So it's how could they finance the company just on the company's own merits? And they'll, they'll finance it, some with equity, some with debt, and what's the cost of each of those and what's the blend of the two. And the higher the quality, the company, and the more predictable, sustainable, and transferable the cash flows, the more the company could finance it with debt because it makes sense. The more sustainable the cash flows, the more debt within parameters, of course, the more, the more debt you can put on the company because it's debt doesn't go away when there's a downturn. The debt keeps <laughs> coming at the owner. So, yeah. so you have to have really sustainable cash flows to finance with debt. And the, the higher the quality, the lower the cost of debt. So if you, I mean, it makes sense. You think these banks have prime rates, they have preferred rates, they have, you know, they'll lend to some companies at prime or LIBOR, they'll lend to other companies at prime minus a half a point, they'll lend to some other companies at prime plus two or prime plus five. And then you can always have non-bank lenders that might be lending at, you know, interest rates up in the, up in the mid and high teens. Mm -hmm even into the 20s. And you have factoring companies that are lending to the company at an effective cost of debt that sometimes are north of 50% when you really figure out the cost of the debt. I have no idea what that was like. <laughs> right? I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's unbelievable. Was... It's unbelievable. So, well, and, and it, what's in that, that's probably a lot for the listeners, but I think if they, like for the listeners, the reason we're getting into this is because it's time to dive into the technical stuff of this. And it's so important for you to understand, because this is what's going to level up because this is what the private equity firms and buyers that have any two cents are going to be doing, right? They're going to go look and say, okay, this, I don't want to, because the stuff that we're talking about right now are people that are they're doing these purchases for a return on investment versus someone that wants to go buy your business for a job, right? So that's, they're buying a salary. That's right. completely different, yeah. right? This is, exactly. yeah. and, and so maybe Ken, because I think in, uh, you know, you and I were talking, you, a lot of people understand real estate. So how can you maybe, I don't know if there's a, an example or a, you know, a scenario off the top of your head that you can, you can boil it down into like rent rates, cap rates, and like the value of, you know, of how that all works in real estate. Because I think a lot of people are familiar with that. I mean, I don't know if, if it makes sense to, to give that example. Well, I mean, I'll just make up one and hopefully it will make, make sense. No, 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 for let's sure. suppose you have a, um, let's suppose you have a high, a, a skyscraper in uh, midtown Manhattan and it's fully leased with, you know, grade triple A tenants who, and they're, everybody's under, you know, 15 year leases, pretty high quality piece of real estate. So an investor would look at the cash flows associated with that, look at the quality, the underlying quality of the tenants, 
um, the length of the contracts and so forth, the the area where the comp where the where the piece of real estate is located, and they will capitalize those cash flows, the annual cash flows. So they'll they may say, and I'm just going to make up a number. Yeah. Number won't relate to a, a skyscraper, but <laughs> so let's say they have you know ten million dollars of ca of cash flows annually, and they may they they capitalize they may put a cap rate of ten percent on that. So a cap rate is the inverse of a multiple. So if they put a cap rate of ten percent, it means it's a ten times multiple. Ten times ten million, a hundred million in that case would be the value say of, of a particular building. Mm -hmm. Now let's yep. say you take, you take another building, let's say it's the same size, but it's in a, it's in a, uh, it's in Detroit, right? It's in downtown Detroit. And, um, and it's, it's in an area where maybe there, you know, a lot of businesses have gone out of business because of the auto, the U S auto industry. I'm again, I'm just making up a fact pattern yep, yep. and you have uh, a, you have, you have a lot of tenants, but the, the leases are sh shorter because companies don't want to commit for the long term. And maybe it's not triple A grade tenants. Maybe they're, you know, single, single A grade tenants and so forth. And you don't know what's going to happen in that region economically, whether it's going to continue to be depressed or whether it might come back. Well, somebody wants to buy that building and let's say it has $10 million of annual cash flows. Instead of, you know, if, it, if it's in a depressed area like that, they, a, a buyer might not be putting a 10% a cap rate on it. They might be putting a 20% cap rate on it. 20% would be a five times multiple. So five times 10 million would only be 50 million. It would have half the value of the building that's in, say, Midtown Manhattan. So that well, well, is... Higher well, risk, right. lower value. Well, what's interesting too, because I mean, it just correlates to, to stocks too, because junk bonds have fifteen percent rate of return, right? Versus yeah, you know, U.S. Exactly. Treasury three yeah. yeah. percent. So it's and and what is interesting about that when you were talking about your cost of capital, which is the blend of equity and debt, like a bank's not going to go give you a huge loan to finance that Detroit office because it's too risky, right? So you're going to have to, you know, literally purchase it if you want that, but you're taking the risk on yourself in order to get that, that um, cash flow. Yeah. The higher the risk, the more equity is needed to make the acquisition and equity has a much higher cost than debt typically. Well, what's interesting too, Ken, if you think about these private equity firms and family offices who are deploying their capital when, you know, and that, everybody's talking about the trillions of dollars. And I think you and I talked, it's up to $2 trillion of dry powder, which is non-deployed capital, which is essentially yeah. money that has not bought investments out of family offices, private equity firms, and corporations. Is If you got a private equity firm, let's say they got $25 million fund, you know, they can go buy more high-valued companies because they use more debt versus if I, you know, if, if I have to go put you know, five companies with five million bucks and I could buy five, five companies versus if I have to put $10 million and I can only buy two and a half. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. They can leverage their fund. Yep. So that's why, comp that's why private equity firms typically like to buy high quality companies, leverage them up and then step on the gas pedal, right? And really grow them. And well, and I think it also ties into the, it, it, that, which is why they, the the bigger the company is, the less risk that those cash flows are going to go away. So that's why I think there is no real help for the lower mid market, which is the people where they can't sustain big issues because you know they can't put a bunch of debt on there. The finance the financial buyers are not as per, uh, or, uh, predominant because there's just too much risk and they can't leverage their thing. Versus like having someone that's going to come in and do more of a, like a turnaround like you were which then they can then harvest the value. So, I mean, it's just this huge open spot in the marketplace that just doesn't get the help and the understanding of the stuff that we're talking about. Yeah, it's a, it's a very disjointed, dysfunctional, fragmented marketplace, the lower middle market. Um, well, and can you explain like the, the, I mean, I don't know if we want to get this some detail of the, the cost of equity of the, the buildup method of like what people should be, and I don't know if we want to get into that, but I think that's where it, 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 it clearly like shows where the VOP system and identifying your valuation and your company specific risk fits into that whole picture. 
Well, let me see if I can do it in a simplified manner. So if you think about people, people invest in the public stock markets. And historically, if you look back over the last 50 years, the stock market has generated an annual return of about 10%. Okay. So 10% becomes the kind of, again, as an example, the required return for for a private investor to invest in the stock market, they pretty much expect about a 10% annual return, okay, on their investment. If you think about now investing instead of into the stock market, you're investing into an individual private company, much riskier proposition. So clearly you're going to expect a much higher return than you would from your diversified public company, you know, 401k, um, index fund or something like that. Mm -hmm. So how much is that incremental required return? How much additional return is necessary to attract an investor to invest into a private company? Well, there are kind of two big pieces that explain the incremental required return. One is a size premium because most private companies are smaller than most public companies. And public companies, as you mentioned, larger companies, as you mentioned, can, are, they're better able to withstand shocks to, mm-hmm. to, the, to their company, to their industry, or to the economy. Um, so smaller private companies don't have as much wiggle room or as much ability to withstand shocks. So mm-hmm. investors, just based purely on size, they want a bigger return for that additional risk. And there's no like public market for you to just to, you know, drop your shares on someone else. <laughs> well, there's no liquidity. There's no, so there's a liquid, there's a, there's a size premium and a liquidity premium. There's actually three components. So you're right. The, the liquidity piece is a, is a second piece um, because you can't, if you want to sell your private investment, you, you know, good luck to you. Maybe you can do it in a year or so. Um, public companies of course have immediate liquidity. Mm-hmm. So the, um, so size and liquidity account for about a third to a ha- as much as a half of the incremental required return that an investor would, would require in order to invest in a private company. But the third component, the third factor um, is a, a factor called company specific risk, which is what we've been talking about all of these qualitative factors in private companies, in pub, they exist in public companies too, but it's a much lower risk in a private company than in a public company. And I'll explain that in a minute. But so company specific risk could be any, it could add anywhere from two or three additional points of required return to as much as maybe 25 points of required return. So if you think about an investor who's investing into a, the public markets looking for a 10% annual required return to a private company where um, the company specific risk factor alone could push that 10% up to, you know, 30% or Mm -hmm. 45% or, you know, plus an additional premium for the size and for the liquidity. So it's not unusual. That's why venture firms, venture uh, capital investor firms, you know, they have required returns in their investments that are sometimes north of 40%. Private equity firms are in the 35% range. That's why. It's mm-hmm. because of the risk factors that, are, that exist in the companies in which they're investing. So why, why do private companies have such uh, higher company-specific risks than public companies? Because public companies are constantly under the scrutiny of all of these outside independent entities, the, the stock analysts and bond analysts, the SEC, the independent boards of directors, independent mm-hmm. auditors, all making sure that the public companies are the lowest risk they possibly can be. Mm-hmm. And that they have all of these qualitative attributes fully in place, fully developed, fully functioning at all times to keep the risk low so that the sustainability, predictability, transferability of future cash flows is at its peak. Private mm-hmm. companies don't have any of that outside independent oversight, so they, and they're not educated about it, so they ignore all of these company-specific risk factors. And those factors come home to roost when they, these owners decide they want to go sell their companies. If you look at the statistics, the success or failure statistics of private 
owners who try to sell their companies, it is absolutely staggering. And it's all, it's mostly all related to that company specific risk factor. It's all of these elements, whether you call it due diligence factors or qualitative factors, risk factors, whatever you want to call them, it's all of these internal factors. We call them intrinsic. We call it intrinsic value because it's all these internal factors that are largely within the owner's control. They can improve those factors. They can increase the quality and reduce the risk of their companies and capture a lot of that value that is being depressed or constrained or eroded by all of these, these risk factors. They have the ability to do it, but they have to be shown where the factors are, where the risks are, where they need to uh, focus their time and resources. Well, and so well said, and I, and you can tell there's decades of passion coming out and, and it's the same thing that I, like, this is why you and I have been, you know, getting so close over the last couple of years, because they're like, there is no rule book, right? For the privately held companies. And like, if I, if I think about just how ridiculous it is in, in common sense words is, you know, for my old industry, you could have two companies, same size, same, all this, all, but like one of them uses the worst ERP system ever. And one of them doesn't. And one of them has the best and breed and all that stuff. So like, they, they, those are the internal factors, but you, you know, it's, it's painful stuff to have to do and when and how you spend your money and all those different things. So like now there's getting to be a rule book of understanding what and how to do this stuff. But the, the uh, it just is so, the, the, the value that should be harvested should be the owner who created and took all the risks is kind of where I come from where it's like, yeah, like, like not only would a future investor pay more because they want it, but like you now have the roadmap, like you said, to double or triple your company value because you just, you know what people are looking for. You've leveled the game. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, too often owners, they remain uneducated about all of the, all of this until the time that they go to market. And then they get an indication of interest for their company and they get all pumped up about it and they accept the indication. They sign they, they might sign an exclu exclusivity with a, you know, potential buyer or whatnot. They get into what I call the due diligence slaughterhouse. <laughs> all of these factors start surfacing and due diligence might last four, five, six months, eight months sometimes, and the, the, the buyers wear down the sellers um, by continually raising these kinds of issues and flushing out all of these issues that actually do exist. So nothing against the buyers. Right, right. Um, but it takes them time to flush out all of the stuff. And then in, in the ultimate um, result is, well, we'll still either one of two things, either we'll still buy your company, but not at that price, not at the price that we initially indicated mm -hmm. because of all these, we have to now invest into all of these areas to strengthen the company. So we're mm -hmm. going to deduct value for all of, all of that because we have to bring that value to the company. So sometimes they'll, they may cut the value by, you know, who knows how I, you know, a, yeah, a lot or, or like, yeah. Or the, and this is where it, it, the, the dynamics are so, you know, skewed. There's such a, um, in the, what is you call it? Asymmetrical power yeah. situation because, you know, you have someone that knows everything that walks in and all of this stuff that should have been being done. You just, you're just such at a disadvantage. And yeah. what, what, what's interesting, Ken, is that I want to like you and I have uh, rallied around a couple of these different additional points that a lot of people, when these owners are talking and the listeners, you sit down in front of your peer group or your other owners and people talk about, Oh, well, so-and-so sold for this much. You know, maybe you can get, I'll give my definition. You give yours of there's a big difference. And actually my partner, Jim, uh, at GEXP, who's an M&A attorney has talked about this because he deals with, you know, over the years has been dealing with transaction value. So that's the stuff that's in the, the databases that you're talking about where there yeah. might be a, a strategic reason to buy it, right? There's just, yeah. so the rate of return is going to happen outside of the cash flows. It's going to be through cross-selling customers or whatever it might be. So the, a lot of people talk about the transaction value, which yeah. hand, you know, tends to lean towards a strategic, but the intrinsic value is what the owner can control, which is the rate of return 
on the capital and equity that's tied in their business. Then if they do that stuff correctly, then they can go fetch the buyer that they want to right. capitalize more on a strategic transaction value. But I think there's a huge difference between those two and a lot of people don't understand that. Well, if, if a company, so think about it, think of intrinsic value as more closely related to the value that a financial buyer would pay for a company. Mm -hmm. So a financial buyer that will not gain any synergies or anything by buying that company or a financial buyer might be just an individual operator who, as you mentioned earlier, is buying the company because they want to buy themselves a, a career a job. They want to buy themselves a CEO position. So they get a bat, they get a financial backer and they come and buy the company because they want to run it. Um, intrinsic value is closer to what they would pay. And a lot of times those uh, transaction value from a financial buyer will be very close to the intrinsic value of the company. A strategic buyer is, a, you know, of course, a buyer that has the ability to gain synergies through the acquisition synergies by eliminating duplicate overheads or synergies by taking the seller's business into the buyer's customer base and marketplace and they're therefore growing it a lot faster mm -hmm. so so they are typically willing if there are synergies uh, that that are available they are typically willing to pay more than what a financial buyer will pay um, they may not well, give the seller total right. credit for all the synergies, but they'll give them some credit. Well, and this is so, I think what's so interesting about how this all ties together, Ken, is like, you know, a lot of, you know, there's a lot, this whole exit planning wave that's been going on and some of the value building. That's why, like, for us, I wanted to tie it all together because if the owner, like, for example, and I think the, the, the listeners have heard me say this a lot, but we, for us to get the dollar amount that we needed in order to make the sale worth it, we had to sell to a strategic buyer that then we had lots of duplicate and overhead and all this stuff. So we had to quote unquote kind of gut the company in order to hit our dollar amount yeah. for the value that we wanted to harvest out of that, which the outcome of that was not as, not what I wanted, you know, and versus, you know, my dad had a little bit different opinion on it, but yeah. um, you know, but what happens is if the, if the, in, so I think that's what happens is a lot of people go from that LOI to like, okay, in order to do this, and then they start, you know, essentially, you know, making a Frankenstein out of their company to get the dollar amount, you know, because they're solving from the dollar amount instead of what they want, which leads to a lot of these unhappy events versus going, okay, if you took a system like yours and you had all, you started doing your tax planning, your state planning, you're doing all the technical stuff on the outside, yeah. but building the intrinsic value to say, let's say you wanted to make sure that you netted 5 million bucks. You, you make sure that you get that no matter what by doing what you're talking about. And then you can pick your buyer 100% and make sure that you, now it's the, all the additional, you know, more soft stuff that's important to you, like the type of buyer, what they're going to do to your business afterwards. And right. you've got to stay to it versus just being like totally whiplash to the process. No, that's a great point. If you are at the highest intrinsic value that you can, that you can achieve, your options on exit are much more wide open to you. So you can be appealing to financial buyers, strategic buyers, individual operators. Um, your options are more open. You'll have more competition for the, for the transaction and you'll, you will achieve the highest possible transaction value for wherever transaction values are at that point in time in the marketplace. As you, as you know, transaction values kind of go up and down mm -hmm. in different economic cycles. And so, um, it's, it's interesting because even to correlate that can to, to public, um, companies, you know, all the spec, that's the speculation, right? There's a lot of speculation that goes on in the marketplaces, which is all the day trading and all that stuff versus, you know, even in the ups and downs of the, the markets each day, that's fine. But the companies are still making what they're making. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it just is what it is. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, you and I also, as we're kind of winding down here, you, we both have a deep passion and, and a heart out for kind of the wave that's happening. And, you know, you in the training and some of the stuff we've been talking about over the years is kind of the sheer numbers that's going to happen. And I don't know what your two cents is, or if you want to kind of rattle off kind of the segments I've been using your U S segments, um, yeah. graphic on like the, the various like sections of companies and kind of the average age and what you kind of see happening over the next five to 10 years? 
Well, yes. Yeah, so I'll stick to the lower middle market for that purpose. So roughly 350,000 companies in the U.S., private companies that fall into the lower middle market, five to a hundred million in annual revenue. And about, uh, there's, there's a book that was written by a, one of the, one of the sort of, I'll call them, I'll call them the, one of the godfathers of the exit planning industry, Peter Chrisman, um, who realized in his, through his research for his book that 70% of those companies are owned by baby boomer owners. And so over the next 10 to 15 years, and that window has shifted, it still seems like a 10 to 15 year window now, over the next 10 to 15 years, about 70% of those owners will need to transfer the ownership of their companies to a new owner, whether that's an internal transfer to management, to their family, or an outside transfer through a sale. They will need to transfer. Well, and, and, and Ken, I'll, if, for the listeners, I'll, I'm actually looking at that slide. I'm just going to read these off because I think it's people just don't really get this because it's, again, it's, it's not like there's a Zillow out there for this stuff. There's 27 million incorporated companies, right? That does 30 trillion in sales. And of those, and correct me because this is your side, <laughs> but you know, there's 21 million, 21.7 million companies that do a trillion of those sales that are non-employees. So they're the solopreneurs, the freelancers that don't have employees. So it's not a sellable company, it's a job. Right. So then you got 6 million left and 21,000. Actually, I had someone correct me recently that said that's probably a couple years old because there's only 18,000, he said, that are over 100 million. So those are the people that are getting Accenture, you know, Ernst & Young, KPMG type level help. Every All the advisors flock to them because they've got a lot of cash flow. So they employ 56 million employees and they're 20 trillion of sales. And then the lower middle market, which is you said five to hundred is 350, which is 5.8 trillion in sales and 30 million employees. And then the micro market, which you said is under 5 million is 5.6 million companies yeah. that employ 35 million employees. So like what I look at this, Ken, I'm like, that's 65 million employees out of our 320 million Americans that are employed by small bin market companies that are owned by baby boomers. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I, I just, and like in what, what I find, and I don't know what your thoughts are on this is like, and the people that are under 5 million in revenue, it's like, that's very difficult to find buyers that, you know, you're getting business broker level help where so it's listed on a website. Yeah. You're not getting financial help like we're talking about. And it's just difficult where it's a massive amounts of wealth that are going to potentially be eroded. And I don't know. I like, I've been kind of calling up like anybody that's in my, you know, in the thirties age bracket or even lower millennials and stuff like start stepping up and like buying a business or mm -hmm. even like, I don't know, like pretty much it needs to be a full fledged effort to help these people. <laughs> I don't know how it'll be interesting to see how it all turns out. Well, if you look at the, you know, historical statistics too of companies in those size brackets that try to go to market, some of it is anecdotal through just talking with a lot of private equity firms or, or research that comes out of uh, associations like the Alliance of M&A Advisors. When, when these private owners try to go to market, they, they approach an intermediary or a broker or somebody to help them about 80% of the time they're turned away. They're told their company is not high enough quality. It's not, it's not sellable. So you look at say in the lower middle market, 350,000 companies, which I think is kind of where there is a, um, you know, it's a, it's sort of the sweet spot for making a lot of the kinds of improvements that we're talking about because companies have enough bandwidth to be able mm -hmm. to do it. Some of them, a lot of the micro market companies are really small and they don't have the bandwidth of team. They don't have the resources to be able to make a lot of improvements. The lower middle market companies typically do, but if 80% of those companies get turned away, then only that, that's roughly, that roughly means only about, uh, well, first of all, if 70% of them try to go to market, that would be about 250,000 that mm -hmm. might try to go to market over the next 10 to 15 years. If 80% of those 250,000 get turned away, only about 50,000 will actually be brought to market. Okay. And, then, and then you look at the statistics that come out of like Pepperdine University, which indicate that when companies do go to market, there's about a 40% 
transaction failure rate, which means they either don't get any offers, so they weren't ready in the first place, or they get indications of interest, they get offers, then they get into the due diligence slaughterhouse, and the deal either falls apart, which happens about half the time, it just falls apart and doesn't close, um, or they have to grant seller concessions to get the deal to close. And so, you know, only about six or seven percent, something like that, of companies that go to market that, that try to go to market actually close on timing and terms that are appealing to them. Well, it, which is just like so crazy. <laughs> and like, and the, the seller's concessions, you know, you're talking about you get you you go through the six months of due diligence, you wanted 10 million, now you're getting three million up front, three million in earn odds for sales projections yeah. and you know, keeping your employees or that. And so you're like, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, and, and, and the, the concessions part is what's really painful. That's where a lot of the seller remorse comes from because they get an indication of interest. They get all fired up about it. Their families know about it. You know, their, their friends know about it. Eventually the employees know about it. Too many people know about it. And then it drags on and it gets kind of blown up in due diligence. And now they, the owner can't really back out of the transaction because they're trying to save, save face. Mm -hmm. They, you know, their families have often already committed the proceeds of the sale to some, you know, other endeavor, something like that. They, so they can't back up, back out of it. And they're sort of stuck between a rock mm -hmm. and a hard place. And they end up taking a deal that they would never have taken if they knew that was the deal at the outset. Mm -hmm. But they, they take it to just, finally get it done, get it closed and get out. And then they have reseller remorse after that. They, they feel like they got, they got shafted. So to the, the listeners going, okay, don't want that to be me. And, you know, based on all the stuff we've talked about, you know, what would be your, your big takeaway for listeners that are, you know, listening to this, thinking proactively, like what would be, you know, the, the thing you want to leave with the listeners? I think the takeaway, the big takeaway message is you want to run your company at the highest quality you possibly can at all times. You don't want to start improving the quality only to prepare for a sale. You want it because it, then you may never get to the sale transaction. Um, and if opportunities come along to sell the company in the meantime, you may not be able to take advantage. You want to run the company in a continuous improvement process, get yourselves onto a focused, disciplined way to run your company. And, and just start running it that way as soon as you can. And if you end up running it at a high level for 10 or 12 years, if you have that kind of runway ahead of you, well, then great. You'll be able to take advantage of opportunities as they may arise. And, and, make, and make a bunch of money and have a lot of fun. And have a lot of fun, yeah, yeah. less stress, more, more work enjoyment, better you know, work-life balance. And you'll be able to sell your company on time, timing and terms that, that are appealing to you. And so just start early and um, make it, it, can, it, it doesn't have to be a grueling process. Continuous improvement can be a slow and steady improvement. But when you go through that kind of a, you go through a continuous improvement process for say three or four or five years or longer, even if you're doing it a little bit at a time, you look backwards at the end of that time period and you can't believe how much uh, yeah. I had, I've had many turnaround clients over the years, two years, you know, a year and a half, two years into a turnaround when they say to me, I cannot believe what we were doing in our company before this turnaround process. I can't believe what we were doing <laughs> and what we weren't doing yeah. Two, yeah. You know, a year and a half and two years ago. I love it. So if the listeners want to get in touch with you, look at your, the VOP system, which is also going to be integrated in our services, but also look at the certification, whatever it is, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Well, our website is corporatevalue.net, just like it sounds, corporatevalue.net. My email is K for Ken, my last name. So it's K, then San Gennario, S-A-N-G-I-N-A-R-I-O. So K San Gennario at corporatevalue.net, office number 508-870-5805. And I'd be happy to uh, chat with anybody who's interested. Love talking about this stuff. We've gone on for longer than an hour. We could <laughs> really go another hour. I'm sure. I know you and I could. <laughs> so we'll, have to, we'll have to cut it off. But um, yeah, I'd love to Ken, chat with anybody who's interested. 
It's been so fun having this back on and having you back on the show and diving into this stuff. I think it's going to be just what the listeners want. So I hope everybody enjoyed it. And I thank you very much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun.